All right, so let's quickly recap what we talked about last time. Um, so we, we talked about the CHSH game, right? This non-local game. Um, and uh, in particular, we saw that it has, um, you know, it's, it's a non-local game played between, you know, uh, a, a classical referee and two quantum players, Alice and Bob, right? And we assume that Alice and Bob uh, can't communicate with each other, but instead they interact with the, the referee. Um, and this game, you know, it has quantum advantage, meaning that using quantum entanglement, Alice and Bob can, uh, can win this game with a higher probability than what's allowed um, classically. So the, the quantum value of this game, which is denoted by this omega star of CHSH, is this um, cosine squared pi over h value. Well, it's exactly equal to it. Um, and this is, you know, 0.854. So we saw that based on this thing called Searleson's bound, this is the optimal quantum value. Like no quantum strategy can do better than this. Okay, so um, that's what Searleson bound proves. Um, and we also saw that um, not only is this the uh, optimal winning probability, but this game has this rigidity phenomenon. So the CHSH game is rigid. So let's just re remember what that means. Um, and I'll rewrite the, the theorem statement. So it says that if you walk up with any quantum strategy for the CHSH game, so what's a strategy? Well, it's some quantum state that's shared between Alice and Bob. And it's a collection of measurements that they both perform when they get their particular questions in the game. So, so let's say that this is a, a D-dimensional strategy in the game. And all you know about this strategy, I mean, this dimension D could be arbitrary, it could be like two or a hundred or a million or anything. Um, you just know that it achieves the quantum value. So that actually places very strict constraints on what this strategy can look like. So the conclusion is that there exists these local changes of bases. Um, formally speaking, there are these isometries. So there's gonna be an isometry for Alice that maps her part of the state, which we call A, to some new spaces that I'll call A1 and A2. And there's an isometry for Bob that maps uh, to B1 tensor B2. Both of these are two-dimensional two spaces, A1 and uh, B1. Um, and under this basis change, you see that this strategy S looks exactly like the textbook strategy that you know we know and love. Um, so if we let theta denote applying these local change of bases to the state that they share, then the state factors into the EPR pair and some junk state. And their measurement observables look like the, the poly Z and X um, observables. So I'm just, you know, re reviewing 
what we proved last time. Well, oops, this is, should be uh, A1. And um, furthermore, like this theorem can be made robust in the sense that this strategy didn't actually need to succeed with exactly the optimal success probability. Um, if it, if they won with probability, say, you know, optimal minus epsilon, then all of these equalities will just be replaced with um, approximations. Um, Henry? Yeah. Isn't it the case that in the classic, uh, in the textbook strategy, Bob doesn't execute Z and X, but uh, the plus and minus operators? <clears throat> oh, right. So um, it, uh, you're right. Uh, this does look a little different from the textbook strategy. So um, I'll just make a note here. So, you know, the textbook strategy says that, um, you know, Bob should be, um, you know, a Z plus X and Z minus X. But um, these are actually, uh, you can conjugate these with some, uh, another change of bases to get exactly Z and X again. So in some sense, like these two matrices are the same, it, it's just you, so that change of basis is folded into your choice of W. Okay. So yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so there's, there's like two ways of thinking about uh, what the textbook strategy is. One is the one that you saw where they share the EPR pair and, but Alice and Bob's operators look a little different. The other way is to think of it uh, here where Alice and Bob both apply Z and X, but the state that they share is, um, it's kind of like a slightly twisted version of the EPR pair. It's the EPR pair where Bob's side has an additional unitary. Any questions about um, like what's the meaning of this um, this statement? So one thing that's important to note like, so this is kind of a mouthful, right? Like this theorem statement has like a lot of parts, um, like there's these isometries and, and things like that. Um, but these, like any rigidity statement, I mean, okay, so what is the rigidity statement morally saying? Uh, it's saying that there's essentially just a unique quantum strategy to win optimally in, in this game. Um, and, it, but this uniqueness has to be like, there's always some wiggle room because like imagine that Alice and Bob took the, the unique, or took the textbook strategy um, and they just applied some arbitrary change of basis uh, locally on their, uh, their own side. And I mean, this clearly won't change the success probability of um, their strategy. I mean, they're just, you know, just kind of like changing coordinates, but you know, it doesn't fundamentally affect anything. So any rigidity statement has to take that into account but this theorem is saying that's the only thing you need to take into account. But aside from that, you really just, just have this. Um, so this rigidity statement is really powerful um, because this is a way for this purely classical verifier to start getting like a very precise handle on what 
quantum operations, um, these two players are, are doing, right? So, you know, you imagine that you, you're this classical referee and these two unknown quantum devices uh, are out there and you're interacting with them and you have no idea what's going on inside of them. Like they can be arbitrarily complicated, but by playing the CHSH game, um, and if you see that they're winning with this optimal probability or close to it, then you actually have, like, you know, structurally inside those devices, essentially what's going on. Like they, they have no other choice. Um, and so we're going to use this idea, this rigidity um, phenomenon, um, not just to, to force Alice and Bob to share a specific quantum state and perform specific quantum measurements, but we can actually force them to perform our favorite quantum computations. And in that way, we can actually classically verify uh, quantum computations. Um, but before we get there, actually, uh, I have to just describe a couple other um, non-local games um, other than the CHSH game that will have um, properties that will be slightly easier for us to use. Um, so let's discuss those. Okay, so one downside of the CHSH game is that the optimal quantum success probability, it's, uh, it's not 100%. Um, you know, it's this like 0.85.4 uh, value. Um, so, you know, that's uh, kind of a annoying, it's not as nice. Um, you know, so for example, like imagine that you're this classical referee and, you know, you're interacting with these two devices. How do you know that they're winning with a probability that's exactly cosine squared pi over eight? I mean, you, it's not possible, right? Um, you know, the only thing you can do is just play this game repeatedly with the devices and, and just try to get some empirical estimate of how often they're winning. So you're, you're just going to get some approximation of their, their winning probability. Um, so, you know, so that's, that's one thing. Um, so uh, it'll be nicer to have a, a, a rigid game that actually has a quantum success probability of 100%, right, where they can win 100% of the time. So, so uh, this, inch, you know, this motivates the, uh, something called the magic square game. So this is going to be a game that um, has quantum value one. Um, and the classical value is going to be um, strictly less than one. And it's going to be a, uh, a rigid game, like there's a, again, essentially only a, a unique uh, optimal quantum strategy. Um, so, so this game is a, a slightly more involved than the CHSH game, so how, how does it work? It's based on the following setup. So let's imagine that um, we have a three by three grid. And um, the goal is you wanna populate each of these squares with zeros or ones. Um, that satisfy two constraints. One, one is that all rows have to have um, even parity, like meaning if you sum up the, the ones and zeros, you get an even number. Whereas in all the columns, if you sum up the zeros and ones, you get odd parity. Okay. So uh, is this possible? No. Nope. And why not? Because uh, uh, count the parity of uh, the sum of all the boxes, if you count it uh, via the rows, you have that each box has, or each row has even parity. So in total, the entire nine boxes have even parity. 
Um, whereas if you count it with the columns, each column is odd parity, so the nine boxes have odd parity. Exactly. So there's there's no way to fill out these these squares that satisfy all these constraints. You're always going to get at least one of the squares, like, or you're always going to violate at least one of the constraints. Um, so um, okay, so so that's uh, you know that's pretty straightforward. So let's turn this uh, into a non-local game. And the way this game works is that the referee is going to pick a random row or column so there's six choices right there's three rows or, or three columns just pick a random row or column call it x so um, so X, let's say it comes from the set R1 up to R3, C1 up to C3. And then uh, it also picks a random cell within that row or column, right? So there's, there's nine cells, right? We can label them um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So, you know, for example, the referee could randomly choose to pick column C2, so this middle column, and then it will pick a random cell, maybe cell number eight. Um, so the referee will pick these things and then the referee sends uh, X to Alice and then Y to Bob. So the important thing is when Alice gets her, let's say she gets a column, she has no idea what, which of the three cells Bob received. Uh, in, on the other hand, when Bob sees his cell, he doesn't know whether it was the row or a column that intersected that cell, um, which one that Alice got. Okay, so so it you know they have incomplete information about um, uh, the questions. So what are they supposed to respond with? Alice is supposed to just give an assignment of the three cells in her row or column. Assignment of zeros and ones. Okay. And then Bob responds with just a single bit. That's supposed to be an assignment to the cell that he received. Okay, okay so this is. Um, like the questions and answers they get, um, how do they win? Well, they win if, well, Alice has to respond with an assignment to like a row or column. So her answers have to satisfy the, the parity constraint. Right, corresponding to whether she got a row or a column. And Bob's um, answer for the cell has to match what Alice got. So this is the winning condition. Does, does that make sense to, to everyone? All right, so, you know, Alice is, let's say again, take this middle column, Alice is gonna give bits for box two, five, and eight. Um, Bob is going to only answer for box eight and they just have to match on that bit. And furthermore, Alice is, uh, the, the parity of her answers has to be, in this case, odd. Right. 
Um, okay. So I, have, I have a very basic question. Uh -huh. <laughs> what is the parity on a row or the parity on a column? Uh, if you have like, you know, the, the bits specified on a particular row, uh, mm -hmm. when you say it has a parity of X, what exactly do you mean by that? Oh, so, uh, I mean, X refers to whether, which row or column she got. So let's like, again, if X was say, you know, the, the first row, yep. then she gives it three bits, right? A1, A2, A3. And then the parity of those bits, like if you sum up those bits, it has to be an even number. Whereas if you okay. sum along a column, it has to be an odd number. That's what I want to know. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so, you know, this is the magic square game uh, as a non-local game. I'm just going to abbreviate it as uh, MS. Um, and the classical value of this game It's going to be strictly less than one, as I mentioned. Um, in fact, it's only going to be uh, 17 over 18. Um, I mean, basically the way to see that it cannot be one uh, is that if it were one, it would actually imply that they could consistently fill out all of the squares um, such that uh, it satisfies all of the constraints, but we know that's not possible. So it has to be less than one. Um, and in fact, it, they can win 17 out of 18 times. So that's not too hard to show. But uh, the quantum value is actually one. There's a, um, there's a quantum strategy where, where they can always win, which is kind of strange uh, because, you know, like an, you know, an undiscerning external observer watching them play this game would be like, well, how are they doing this? Um, it would seem like they had a way to fill all of these squares uh, in, in this consistent way, which is impossible. Um, but they're just making use of, of quantum entanglement to do this. Uh, so for this reason, uh, since it has quantum value one, this is off the magic square game is often called a pseudo telepathy game. Right. So, um, so that's an interesting feature of the, um, the magic square game. So what does the quantum strategy look like? Um, it involves two EPR pairs. Okay, so um, there's a total of four qubits and uh, two goes to Alice and two goes to Bob. And um, the measurements they make are also going to be uh, poly measurements. Um, and they're going to follow this, this following table of, of observables. Um, and we're going to draw them on this three by three grid. So I'll just write them out. Okay, so um, each of these letters, like I, X, Y, and Z, uh, denote the standard like poly observables, right? So you know, I is the identity matrix, um, X is the you know this bit flip matrix, Y is uh, this thing. Okay, um, and really, there's an implicit tensor product in between these two, but we just don't write them. Um, so all of these are observables. They're two qubit observables. So like if you're given two qubits, you, you can measure the both of them using um, one of these observables. And each of these observables gives a one bit answer out. So the strategy that they'll use to win with probability one is um, going to be as follows. So when Alice gets her random uh, row or column, let's say she gets the middle column, she's, she has two qubits. So she's gonna measure her two qubits using these three observables in sequence. So she's gonna measure using ZI, 
So she's going to get a bit, she calls that A1. Then she's going to measure the same two qubits um, using this observable, Ix. She's going to get another bit, A2. And then finally, she's going to measure with minus Zx and to get her final bit, uh, A3. Um, right. um, I understood from the description of the game before that Alice doesn't know whether she got a row or column um, or which row or which column. Is that not the case? Oh, uh, she she knows which whether uh, she knows whether she got it, uh, which row and which column uh, she was told. What she doesn't know is the particular cell that Bob received. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So let's say like her question X is. Um, so you know, let me write this out. Let's so for example, let's say that X is equal to C two and y is equal to cell number eight, then um, Alice measures her half of the two EPR pairs using zi, ix minus zx, and each of these yield bits a1, a2, a3. Um, And uh, Bob will just measure his half using minus Zx, and he'll get a bit b. So, um, so one thing that uh, is important to know is like, um, what does it mean to measure? Like, how is it possible to? measure these three observables in sequence. I mean, you can always do that. Uh, but in fact, the order in which she measures does not matter. Uh, this is not generally the case in, in quantum mechanics, but these observables have a very special relationship, which is that in any given row or column, these observables commute with each other. And the fact that they commute implies that Alice can actually simultaneously measure all of them or, or put another way, she can measure them in any particular order. It doesn't matter. Um, she's always going to get uh, um, sort of the same distribution of outcomes. So important uh, point. All right. Um, so we're not going to work through the details here, but um, this strategy actually allows them to win with um, probability one. Uh, and to get some intuition for why that's the case, well, you know, what are the 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 rules for winning? Uh, well, first of all, Alice's answer has to be consistent with Bob's. Um, but notice that they're always going to measure for the cell in which they overlap, they're always going to measure the same operator, right? So like in this case, Alice and Bob measure minus Zx on their two qubits. And since they share an EPR pair, um, they're always going to return the same outcome for that particular square. So that's always going to, you know, that, that part's always going to pass. Now, the other part of the winning condition is that you know, Alice's three bits have to satisfy the, the parity constraint. And the reason that this is always satisfied is because uh, another relationship that these observables satisfy is that if you look in any column, if you multiply the, the observables together, you actually get minus identity. So let me write that here. Well, they don't share an EPR pair if Alice 
first of all measured zi ix and then only me measured minus zx right because the first two measurements changed the shared state but if you use the fact that like the order of measurements do doesn't ma matter we can assume that the minus zx one happened first yes exactly okay um you, you raise a really good point like um you because know, you, you might think well if you're not careful about the order in which you're measuring um uh, when you measure something the state changes and you know it'll no longer be the epr pair that's correct um but um you know the fact that you can change the order uh in any way means you can always uh, without loss of generality assume that alice and bob are measuring the the, the shared square at this at the same time or uh, they, they measure it first um, and the outcomes will always be the same. Um, another way to see it is that even if you say, well, but I want to stick with this order, you know, uh, from top to bottom. And why does it mean that Alice and Bob have the same answer? Um, well, it's because let's, when, um, uh, when Alice measures this first observable, it's going to partially collapse the EPR pairs into some other state. Um, it'll still be partially entangled. Um, so, so that's why there's still some interesting correlations that occur when you measure uh, this, uh, this second observable. And just to make it, to make it clear, when you write ZI, you don't mean that I measure with the observ observ observable, which is Z times I. I mean that the fir first qubit is being measured using Z and the second qubit is being me measured using I. Oh, no, the, the first thing that you said, uh, it, the thing that's the observable that's being measured is, um, is uh, Z tensor I. Oh yeah, and, yeah, that's what I meant. So yeah, like the first qubit is measured using Z, the se second one is measured using I. Oh no, or, that would be a different. Is the way that I'm phrasing it bad. Uh, so if you do it that way, then you're going to get two bits as uh, out, output, right? Because if you measure one qubit and then you measure the second qubit, then you'll have two outcomes. That would actually be- oh, Okay, so, okay, I see. Like, okay, so I phrased it the wrong way, but yes. Oh, okay, sure, thanks. Uh-huh, okay, okay, so maybe, yeah, um, that, that might've been confusing. So. This looks like a two qubit measurement, right? But um, we should, you should think of it since what I'm not saying is measure the first qubit using Z and then you know, ignore this, measure the second qubit using I. Um, that's, that's not what this means. This thing as an observable is like, it's kind of like an entangling measurement. So this will actually entangle the um, Alice's two qubits together in some way and it returns a single bit as outcome. Uh, so, so that means Alice has two qubits and Bob has two qubits. So there are two EPR, uh, two EPR pairs in play? Yeah, that, that's the state that they share. So, okay. so uh, let me just draw a picture. Um, maybe as a side, you should imagine that, you know, here's Alice, here's Bob and they share two EPR pairs, right? This is the first one, this is the second one, and Alice will do a measurement on these two qubits. Um, just to follow up on Yuval's question, um, I'm not quite sure I'm seeing the difference between uh, measuring the two qubits separately. Yeah, I, you know, to me, like how you would implement this experimental, you would be measuring the two qubits uh, separately and you would just multiply their results. Ah, great question. So um, uh, that, would, uh, that would be okay as long as uh, if you didn't plan on doing any further measurements. So here we actually care about the post measurement state. So, uh, okay, so this is a, maybe a good thing to go over. Um, let me choose, um, 
what's one way to do this? Um, so uh, let's look at the let's look at the observable z times z, right? Um, so this is a binary observable. So it uh, it this is equal to a, a projector uh, pi zero minus pi one, right? Um, and the binary measurement that you're performing on these two qubits um, is like this projective measurement, pi zero, pi one. But what is pi zero? It's actually gonna be the projector onto um, zero, zero or one, one. And pi one is going to be the projection onto uh, zero, one, uh, one, zero. So, so let's say I, I took an EPR pair and I decided to uh, measure both of these qubits using the ZZ observable. The, then the point is that this state is invariant under this projector, it doesn't change. So when you perform the ZZ measurement on the EPR pair, it actually doesn't change the state at all. On the other hand, if you measured each qubit separately, then it would actually collapse the state and you would get either zero, zero or one, one. Okay, so I hear what you're saying and I know we're not in like experimental physics, but I have no idea how you actually do such a measurement. Oh, okay, um, good. So how do you actually implement this two qubit measurement? Well, you first have to apply basically a, a, a quantum circuit and then you, you measure, and then you, you like, you know, you, you can just measure one qubit for the outcome. So, um, so how, like, okay, so this is a good question. How, like, how would you actually implement this, um, the ZZ measurement as a quantum circuit? So, I think the easiest way to do it is you introduce an ancilla. Um, let's see, let me do it off the top of my head. Let's do it this way. If you can't think of an example, I get the point conceptually. Yeah. Um, so, So I think it's this way. So let's say you had, um, you wanted to measure like some state psi using like some two qubit state psi using ZZ. Uh, one way to do this coherently is um, you would initialize a, uh, an ancilla in the, I think the um, plus state. And then based on this plus state, you do a controlled operation. You do this controlled ZZ, right? Um, you do a Hadamard and then you measure. And so when you measure, you just get a zero or a one. And the claim is that conditioned on this being a zero or one, you're going to get the appropriate post-measurement state out here. Okay. so. Kind of a digression, but uh, I think it's an important point. Like, um, this is how you do like a non-destructive uh, measurement um, because you you know after you perform this measurement, you could still have some entanglement remaining between um, these two qubits, and that and that's important. So essentially, for the Z Z case, what's going on here is that like um, you actually measure in the st standard ba basis that, that is zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, zero, but then you group two of the uh, outcomes to be like say one, and you group the two other uh, outcomes to be z z z zero. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, exactly, so uh, in, in, in this measurement, you're only learning the, the parity between the two bits, but you're not going to be able to learn the, uh, the, the values of the, each two bits. So, so it's slightly less destructive than measuring each qubit separately. And something that happens here is that even though they'll have the same bit 
value output if you were to just do z on one do z on the other and multiply like we've still got two versions that'll come out one two versions that come out with a negative one uh what makes this non-destructive is that by attaching them to this ancilla qubit you aren't getting out the information about that state you're not assigning values to it uh, you're using another qubit to capture the parity rather than make assignments uh, through measurement. Exactly. Um, you're, you're basically just minimally extracting just the information you need and not, like if you extract too much, then that actually damages the state um, too much. So, so that's another way of thinking about it. Okay, so blah, 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 where were we? Um, so, you know, that's an overview of the, the strategy. Um, and I guess I was saying like, the reason that the parity constraints are always satisfied is because this, you know, this, this sequence of operators has the interesting property that if you multiply along any row, you're going to get identity. Whereas if you multiply along any column, you're going to get minus identity. So it's kind of like, you know, it, it's impossible to assign zeros or ones to these squares to satisfy all the parity constraints. But if you allow yourself to stick in operators, then it then becomes possible. So, so, so this is what this is um, capturing. Henry, it occurs to me that there's one thing I'm still not clear on about the about what Bob and Alice's answers do when they're both sent to the referee. Does Bob have to give the same answer for that cell as Alice? Or does Bob's answer need to insert into Alice's strategy such that what, sh like, say A1 and Bob happen to be the same cell. Does that make it so that B, A2, A3 has to satisfy? or independently A1, A2, and A3 satisfy, and A1 equals B? It's the second thing you said. <clears throat> All right. Well, I, I guess they're equivalent, because if A1 is supposed to be B, then, um, then um, well, oh, OK, anyways, I, yeah, the, I guess the way we should think about it is that um, uh, it, Alice, is, Alice satisfies the parity constraint, and Bob has to match Alice. Okay. Um, okay, so this is um, kind of cool. And uh, like I was saying, uh, this game is rigid. So the magic square game is uh, rigid. And you know, I won't spell out all the details. It's basically the same thing as the, the, the CHSH rigidity. Any strategy that wins with probability one or close to uh, 100%, um, there has to be local isometries under which their strategy looks like the thing I just wrote. Right? There's no way around it. They have to be doing this two qubit strategy and applying this, you know, this interesting sequence of observables, um, and, and that's it. Um, you know, they could be using like a huge d-dimensional strategy, but most of that will be it's just some junk state that that's not used at all. Um, Okay, so, so that's cool. So this is a, a, a non-local game with 100% uh, winning probability. Um, so what, what about the direction in terms of um, trying to certify more uh, entanglement? So CHSH certifies one EPR pair. The magic square game certifies two EPR pairs. What if you wanted to certify more? like, you know, n EPR pairs. So uh, there's a simple game to certify two n EPR pairs. Does anyone have any um, suggestions for how one might do this? At least a, a natural approach that you, you would take.
Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, um, like if you were to design a game, uh, like a non-local game that you know has quantum value that's higher than its classical value, and any strategy that achieves the optimal winning probability um, has to be, you know, uh, isomorphic to a strategy that involves uh, two n EPR pairs. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say that you just need to construct something where Bob answers one bit and <clears throat> Alice answers gives um, n minus one bits in her answer uh, with n EPR pairs. You like on on some level, you can just generalize the magic squares to more dimensions. I like that suggestion. Like magic cubes, magic hypercubes, uh, oh. going deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh huh. Yeah, that's an interesting suggestion. Um, and they have so, to get longer and longer and longer as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, making sort of like generalizing it, the magic square game to like sort of be bigger dimensional is the, the right idea. Um, one way that this could work, uh, I guess the, the thing that I had in mind is something called the, um, what's called the parallel repeated magic square game. <clears throat> and basically the idea is you just, instead of playing one instance of the magic square game, you just play N of them all at the same time, right? So like, have you ever seen those, um, you know, those chess masters that are going around um, playing like 100 simultaneous chess games with, you know, little kids. Uh, it's, it's kind of like the same idea, right? Instead of playing one chess game, you play like 100 of them. Um, and you actually certify the existence of not just two EPR pairs, but two times 100 or two times n. So uh, we still have uh, two players, but now they're supposed to be playing um, lots and lots of copies of the magic square game at the same time. So the referee is going to like, you know, imagine that there's like many, many uh, copies of this three by three grid. You know, there's, there's instance one, two up to N. And for each of these different three by three boards, the referee is going to pick a random row and column and also pick a random cell within that row and column. And so they're gonna, Alice and Bob are going to have to simultaneously uh, respond with assignments to all of those cells and they have to win each of those magic square games all at the same time. Is this at all different from just playing like two N CHSH games? Um, that's a great question. Uh, just give me one second. So let me just write down what the rules. So, um, <clears throat> okay, so before I answer um, Ariel's question, um, so uh, I've defined a new game, right? Like here are the rules of the game, here are the questions and answers that they're supposed to respond with. So I'm going to call this game MS raised to the N for obvious reasons. Um, so you can ask, uh, what is its quantum value? What is the optimal quantum winning probability for this, uh, this repeated game? One. It should still be one. Yeah. Yes, because you just because it's a protocol on each one of them. 
Right. Like the players will just be like, all right, um, we're really good at playing individual games at with a hundred percent probability. So we'll just do that separately. Um, and times, what are the resource requirements for this game? Like what, what the strategy will just be n copies of the original one. So that, that involves two n EPR pairs, right? Okay. So, so this is one, um, the classical value, any, anyone have any guess? So remember that the classical value of the original game is less than one, it's 17 over 18. So uh, what's the classical value of MS to the N? 17 over 18 to the N? Uh, very good guess, but <laughs> that is not true. Uh, which is really surprising. Um, it's not 17 over 18 to the n, um, which you think, well, how, why not? Because all of these games are independent. So why, you know, why don't you just, uh, why couldn't they just like play them all independently? Um, so the, the reason that it's not so straightforward is because Alice and Bob actually see all of these um, questions all at the same time. So Alice sees x1 up to xn all at the same time. And in principle, she can use a strategy that treat that doesn't treat all of the games separately. Like she could use some information about game one to decide what her answer is for game two. Why would she do that? It, it seems like it shouldn't help her because they're unrelated games, but um, this can actually help Alice and Bob. Uh, so there's, it's a, actually a really, this parallel repetition of games is, is really strange. Um, and it takes a lot of work to show that in fact, this, the classical value of this game does decay exponentially, but it's not this simple 17 over 18 to the n. It's, it does decay exponentially with the number of games, but at a rate that's kind of funky. But it, it is, as n goes large, this does go to zero very, very quickly. Is, it the, is, is this algorithm similar to the one for the CH? Uh, at uh, 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 the one that achieves uh, 0 0.81 to, to the power of n for pa parallel CH SH games. Oh, oh, you mean what the bound here is? Yeah. I actually don't. No, 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 no. Okay, no, no, no. Of course, the bound will be di different. I'm asking if the protocol protocols that beat this Tri, 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 trivial answer are, are oh, si, I see. I see si what you're saying. similar to one oh, another, um, another, another. I actually don't know off the top of my head what is what is the strat the classical strategy that beats this. Um, so I've, uh, maybe I'm missing something, but an idea for a classical strategy is, you know, both Alice and Bob just always return one for everything. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, 50% of the time they're going to have gotten lucky and Alice will have been asked a column and they'll win. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so that one uh, will have um, a probability of half to win a single copy. And then to win N copies, this will win with two to the minus N. Um, which is actually worse than, that's much worse than this. Um, like, so clearly like, okay, so I claim that for the single copy of the game, they can do 17 over 18. And if they just naively play n copies of those independently, then, then really their, their winning probability is this. But I, I claim that um, without proof uh, that there actually is a classical strategy, a deterministic strategy that allows them to win with probability that's actually bigger than this. But they, they cannot beat uh, this exponential decaying bound. They have to output their uh, answers all at the same time, right? For every game? All at the same time, yeah. So they're just using like the question, like the fact that they have the question for every game to have a better mm -hmm. strategy. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, it, um, if you're interested, I, I don't know, at some point I can, I can give you a simple example of a game that like uh, just, you know, there's nothing quantum about it. You just have a classical strategy 
and you repeat the game twice and the, the, there's a strategy for the repeated game that has the same exact winning probability as the single copy of the game. And that's because they can sort of like cross correlate their answers in this weird way. Um, okay, so oh, yeah. yeah. Something that's um, kind of weird to me here, and it's also a little weird in the CHSH games that actually playing the game just once doesn't tell me whether, like I'm the referee, say. Mm -hmm. uh, and by being the referee, I'm trying to see if something is outputting EPR pairs. Uh, and I do that by telling my lab assistants, Alice and Bob, to go play this game and I'll give them these assignments. If I play the game just once and they win, I have no idea if they had an EPR pair. I need to keep going and going and going until I start converging on a probability on like a frequency of winning such that I start to think that we're drawing from the EPR generating distribution. And 17 over 18 is already really, really high. And so the number of times I need to play this game to like feel reasonably convinced that we're, well, 17 over 18 is high, but that thing with the one is that if they lose once at all, I know that they're not drawing from the strictly EPR generating distribution. Mm -hmm. Right. But if they have like a, just like a barely faulty, EPR generator. Right. It'll be very many games to tell, like the barely faulty EPR generator from the classical strategy. That's, that's a really good point. Um, so, so I guess there's a couple, um, right. So, so, you know, in terms of like experimental um, uh, usefulness, like to, to like tell whether you, you, you have a good EPR generator, the magic square game is not necessarily the best, best one um, because the gap, right? Between one and 17 over 18 is small. Uh, actually, you're better off using the CHSH game for that. Um, so uh, that's certainly true. Another point is though, like by repeating a game, I mean, this doesn't fully address the concern, but by repeating the game, you can amplify the gap. So here we have a gap between one and something that's exponentially small. So at least in terms of the gap, this, this is much more useful. Uh, but of course, how do you ob obtain this? Well, you need n copies of the, the, the EPR generator. Um, so, um, you know, so this is something actually people think about, like, can you design other kinds of games or in the physics world, they call them bell inequalities where uh, they, they are much more robust towards, um, you know, device imperfections and stuff, but you can still certify the existence of like an EPR pair or, or, or something like that. Uh, to go back to Ariel's question, um, you know, how is this any different from repeating the CHSH game? You can play exactly, do exactly the same thing, like repeat the CHSH game n times, but there's a major issue with, uh, with that. Um, uh, can you see why? Like The fact yeah. that it's not one, it's also can exponentially decay. Yeah. Um, I mean, there, you're gonna have exponential decay uh, for both the classical and quantum values. One's going to decay slower, but it's still going to go to zero really quickly. Um, okay, so the final thing I wanna mention before we take a break is that, so here's the repeated game and, um, maybe it's not surprising that ms to the n is rigid. Um, uh, if you play optimally, if you win with probability one, you really have to have two n copies of the uh, two n EPR pairs. That's not hard to prove. Like you can just in a black box way kind of derive it from the single copy rigidity. What's more interesting is the robust version. Um, suppose uh, you have a strategy that wins with probability uh, one minus epsilon. So think of epsilon as you know something small like 0.1% or something. Then implies that 
their strategy under local isometries must be O of N times epsilon to the one over four close to two N EPRs. Or I, I should, you know, it's, I should say close to uh, N copies of um, so the thing that's want to point out is that the closeness here is not so great, right? Like this is only meaningful if epsilon is really, really small. Like it, epsilon is, uh, you know, goes to zero as n gets larger. Um, and so this is meaningful only when um, epsilon, like less than n to the fourth. Um, and so this is not uh, super great because like in order sort of to like connect it with Sumner was saying, in order to get any guarantee, you really need to like, <clears throat> like if you wanna certify like a hundred existence of a hundred uh, simultaneous EPR pairs, then you need to check that they're winning with probability one minus one over 100 to the fourth. Um, and that will take a lot of samples to estimate. Um, so at least, uh, in, you know, this is not so practical, but you know, this is this is the theorem that we have. Um, and but people have worked to create more sophisticated sophisticated kind of non-local games that um, can certify n EPR pairs, uh, where the robustness, like this this closeness value, does not depend on n at all. So so I'll just write one thing. Um, there's a game. There is a, a game uh, called the poly braiding test. That's much better in this regard. If you win with probability one minus um, epsilon, then you're actually going to be squared and squared epsilon close to n EPR pairs. No matter what n is. So this is like a much more useful um, kind of non-local game. Um, okay, so let's take maybe like a, a five minute break. Let's come back at 515 and then we'll see how we can use this technology in order to verify quantum computations. What if I restrict the, the amount of entanglement, of entanglement that you can use, say? I'm giving you n copies of a game, but I'm allowing you little o of n entangled states. Can you still design a game that you can win with probability one? <clears throat> um, great question. Um, so if the original copy of the game, um, if like the single copy of the game required like, so there's different measures of entanglement, but let's say it required like one uh, EBIT, like that's a, uh, that's a measure of, of entanglement, it's called EBITs, one EBIT of entanglement, okay. then in order to, to win with high probability in the repeated game, you essentially need a linear number of EBITs. So like that's you. You can prove 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 that. Yes, this uh, this we can prove. Uh, even actually to do anything better than exponentially, you know, ex something exponentially small, you, you need a, a linear number of EBITs. Hmm. Um, okay. I see. So we can prove this, but it's it's not quite a rigidity statement because it it only says the says the amount of entanglement is linear in N, but it doesn't tell you structurally what the entanglement has to look like. So that's actually like an open research question. I see. So it could be that like for uh, a single instance of the game, the entanglement, the entanglement needs to be very complicated, but or n repetitions of the game, maybe it doesn't need to be too complicated. If I'm speaking in the right, right terms. 
Yeah, well, I guess it's the, the thing that people are wondering about here is all of these rigidity statements, like we only know how to say meaningful things in what's called like the high winning probability regime, like something that's very close to one, like 99% or, but mm -hmm. um, what if you're only winning with like this repeated game with only um, say 25%? This is still very good because the classical bound is exponentially small. So 25% is much better than that. But we have no idea what to say about their strategy in that regime. Like they must be doing something rigid, but at least that's our guess. Um, but we don't know how to articulate it. Are are there natural examples of games that where you'd get this like twenty five percent or? Well, um, like you can even like for example, you can take this repeated magic square game. Like you know something dumb that you could do is say, well, three quarters of the time I'm just going to sit and do nothing, um, but. 25% of the time I'll actually play the game. So, so that's one example of a strategy. But there, you, I mean, you can see, like you can't get around using um, two N EPR pairs. It's just 75% of the time you decided not to do anything. Um, yeah, so, so basically the, the open question is um, in this in this low winning probability regime, can you still formulate a rigidity statement of some sort? Um, I also have a question. Mm -hmm. So um, when we exp um, describe the closeness to any EPR pairs using complexity like O square root of epsilon, um, is it related to one minus fidelity like when we say O square root of epsilon is one minus fidelity uh, related to square root of epsilon? Right. So I, I guess I didn't spell out what closeness means. Um, there, there's one thing that you need to incorporate into this notion of closeness is you, you get to pick a choice of isometry for Alice and Bob. So, you know, they, there always has to be this freedom and changes of basis. Okay, fine. Then after that, um, the, yeah, the closeness you can measure in terms of one minus fidelity if you want, or um, Euclidean distance. Or, uh, it's not so important what choice of distance you use. Like they're all essentially kind of equivalent up to square roots. Um, so um, so we it, can, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's basically like what you said, up to, up to a local isometry. So we can also measure uh, the degree of closeness by when we change basis, uh, how much do we preserve the entanglement, right? Yes. OK, thank you. I have one other one comment. Um, is a lot of this like certifying the existence of quantum states, uh, you know, in the process of certifying it, you can't, you destroy the states, you can't. Uh, like you can't certify that they have states uh, like available for future use. Mm -hmm. That seems like a, an annoying restriction. Great, yeah, great question. It's like, you know, in the process of certifying, you actually destroyed uh, the entanglement. So there's a way around it, which is you can sort of, um, you can imagine that um, you tell Alice and Bob, like, look, I'm going to play some number of rounds of this game, maybe um, up to 100 rounds, but I won't tell you exactly how many. So you'll, you, you basically kind of keep them on their toes. You like test them, you test them. Um, and, you know, like if they're consistently winning this, like let's say Magic Square game, then you know that they must have um, a reservoir of EPR pairs on hand ready to use, right? But let's say you randomly decide to say at like the, the 57th game, you, you actually just stop. Um, then, then you know that with high probability in the 58th game, they're very likely to have uh, a fresh EPR pair ready to use. So that's, that's a, a, a way in which you can, you know, kind of certify uh, um, that they would, they would have, um, it, you know, entanglement ready. You don't tell them where you're going to stop. You just randomly choose a point to, to stop. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see why that's useful, but that's still kind of like 
you know, regular, old, like maybe they're your best friends. So you just believe them. Like there are all sorts of reasons you could have, you know, to think they have more EPR pairs on hand, but there's no, um, there's no like guarantee and there's no quantum benefits uh, you can get from, to be sure uh, that they have those on hand. Mm. Well, in terms of quantum benefit, well, I, I guess we'll kind of see like, um, so this actually, you know, if you're playing with Alice and Bob and, and, you're, and you're sure that they're not communicating, then, um, then it actually, you don't have to trust them. Like if at any moment they don't have enough EPR pairs, then they won't be able to win the magic square game uh, with probability one. So, so like this magic square game gives you a way to, to, to test that they have enough. Um, so, so like, in fact, at least in, in, in like the world of like uh, theoretical quantum cryptography and things like that, they, they use this, this magic square game as like a sub protocol. They'll say, well, we want to use these EPR pairs to do something like quantum key distribution or, or some other task. Um, but how do we first check that they have these EPR pairs? Well, they'll, they'll pick a, a random number of games to play. They'll like play the magic square game, play the magic square game, play the magic square game. Um, and then uh, at a certain point, like the, the referee is going to be pretty certain that they, they will have an EPR pair ready to go for the next round. So then the referee will just switch to performing the other protocol and the players won't necessarily know. Like the players won't, won't know that they're suddenly being asked you know, playing a different protocol. Um, and uh, this way you can actually leverage this rigidity guarantee to do something uh, else that's useful. Actually, this ties exactly into the thing I wanted to talk about next, which is like, how do you use this to certify um, quantum computations? Um, so, so maybe I'll jump into that. Um, Okay, so, so let's like start a new page. Okay. Okay, so let's go over the setup. Um, we have a, a classical um, verifier or referee, like they're the same thing. So let's say that um, the verifier has a, a n qubit circuit in mind. And what the verifier really wants to know is what happens if I ran the circuit, let's say I, I initialized it to all zeros, did some polynomial time computation and measured it. I wanna know if it accepts with prob high probability or accepts with low probability. So um, let's call it the yes case. Um, you know, let's say, to, just to keep things simple, it accepts with probability one. And in the no case, um, it accepts with probability zero. So the verifier would like to just determine is it a yes case or a no case? Um, but since it's classical, it has no way of, of determining this on its own. So it's going to use the help of some quantum computers. Um, but you know, uh, we're, we're going to adopt like a very paranoid mindset. Um, the classical verifier doesn't trust these quantum computers. You know, what if maybe they're defective or maybe it's just like a, um, you know, a scam or something. So instead, the verifier is going to um, interact, you know, run some interactive protocol with these quantum computers to, to check for itself whether it's a yes case or a no case. Um, so in this, the model that we're going to, the protocol that we're going to talk about, we're going to have two quantum computers that we're going to name Alice and Bob for obvious reasons. Uh, and the classical verifier is going to play games with these two quantum computers uh, to determine uh, yes or no. So that's the, the setup. Um, you know, there's no communication between these two quantum computers. 
And the protocol that we're going to design, we want it to satisfy the following properties. Okay, so one property is that, well, uh, we would like the verifier to, we don't want to demand too much of it. So verifier, it's a classical polynomial time uh, computer. All right, so that's obvious. Um, we want this protocol to satisfy um, a completeness property, meaning that suppose that the circuit C is a yes instance then there should exist a strategy for Alice and Bob to convince the verifier with high probability. Uh, and furthermore, this strategy like has to be efficiently performable by these quantum computers. I mean, this is actually kind of important because, you know, we actually want to run this protocol in the real world. So, um, you know, if the, if the quantum computers are behaving honestly, then, then they should be able to, to carry out this protocol uh, in, in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and then we, on the flip side, if we want a soundness guarantee, which is that if C is a no instance, then no matter what strategy Alice and Bob come up with, the verifier rejects with high probability. And here we can even say, this should still be the case, even if the Alice and Bob are allowed to do, you know, things that are very, very complicated. Like they, there's no limit on their power. Right? I mean, this only strengthens our guarantee. Like no matter how powerful Alice and Bob are, they cannot convince us of a, uh, a yes instance. Okay. So we want to design a protocol setting us find this. And um, if we had such a thing, then this would be a verifiable way of checking quantum computations and the classical referee like doesn't have to trust these quantum computers at all, but it can still um, get a get a guarantee. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, in or, in order to describe this protocol, I, I'm I'm actually going to break this up into uh, different steps. So first. Um, I'm not going to describe a f the, the full protocol, but sort of a simplified setting. So I'm going to describe what's called a measurement based verification protocol. So, <clears throat> so here, um, the setup is as follows, like the, the classical verifier has access to um, a special quantum device. So the, that's, it's called a measurement device. And this measurement device is going to be extremely simple. Um, because all it can do is, you know, it's a box. So I'm just going to call this measurement device M. It gets some state psi, just comes from somewhere. And what the verifier tells the box to do is just measure in either 
each qubit separately in either the x, z, or you know, identity, which means you don't measure it. You know, just, just measure each of the qubits according to some basis, right? Standard basis or x basis or don't measure. And this measurement device is supposed to do it. Uh, and it returns a sequence of outcomes. So it's going to return a1, a2, up to you know, a n, how, how many ever qubits this state has. So it's a, and that's all the measurement device does. Um, it's not capable of doing, you know, running a circuit or, or anything. So by itself, cannot execute full quantum computations. Um, it's really simple, but the important thing is that it's trusted. Like when the classical verifier tells it to do this measurement, it's actually going to do it uh, in an honest way. So the claim is that in this model, um, the verifier can actually verify uh, quantum computations in, in, in a pretty straightforward way. And this makes use of um, our uh, beloved uh, feynman kataev transformation. Okay. So how does it work? Um, well, it actually uses a, a variant of it. So what's the variant? So it's, it's going to be a, um, you know, we saw that given any quantum circuit, you can map it to a local Hamiltonian, right? So in this variant, um, it's going to map circuits to Hamiltonians, but this Hamiltonian is going to satisfy some different properties than, um, than before. So, uh, so this Hamiltonian is going to act on let's call it uh, R qubits. So what's R, it's just gonna be some polynomial in N. Um, each term of this Hamiltonian is going to have a very special form. And it's, it's going to be tensor products of projectors onto either standard basis states or X basis states. So, you know, here's an example. So HI could look like zero, zero, applied to some qubit I1, tensor um, plus plus, acting on qubit I2, and so forth, up to um, minus minus, on some qubit ik. Right. So, so hi acts on qubits, uh, you know, indexed by i1 up to ik. So pretty simple form. Um, another thing is that um, uh, this, this is not going to be a local Hamiltonian. So like the number of qubits that each term acts on could be up to R. Okay, but we're, we're not gonna be so worried about that. Like it's fine that it's not a local Hamiltonian. Another thing is that there could be an exponential number of terms. And in fact, there, there generally will be. Right. Um, despite having so many terms, uh, they're actually efficiently computable because given any index i, the, the verifier can compute uh, uh, any given term.
right? So there's a lot of terms, but each of those terms are easily computable. Um, okay, so just a couple more properties. So we started from a circuit, we created this local Hamiltonian. What's the relationship between the two? If C is a yes instance, then there exists a ground state such that uh, it has energy zero. And if C is a, a, a no instance, then for all states, the energy is actually going to be very high. In fact, it's going to be something like two thirds times N. Right, so there's actually a huge gap between these two cases. And this is something we didn't even see with the feynman kataev construction. Like the feynman kataev construction had like a very, very small gap, uh, some inverse polynomial gap between yes and no. Here, we, we actually have some ginormous gap. And we're able to, to obtain this precisely because we, we don't have a local Hamiltonian and we have exponentially many terms. This is something that we can, uh, we can do. Um, does, does this make sense? Like what the, these properties that uh, are spelled out here? Right, so this, this, it's not a local Hamiltonian, it's just some, some huge Hamiltonian, but it really, this, it captures uh, whether C is a yes instance or a no instance. Uh, when you say that it's not local, you mean that like a single term can like act on all the Q, Q, Q bits. Exactly, yeah. Okay, so um, with this Hamiltonian in mind, uh, the, <clears throat> the verification protocol is going to be very simple. So the verifier is going to um, uh, just pick a random term i, and then it's going to compute the description of this term, right? which uh, I promised you could be done efficiently given the description of the circuit C. <clears throat> and um, what do we know about this term hi? Well, it's this like, tensor product of measurements in the X or Z basis, right? So the verifier is going to compute um, a string of measurement commands. Right, so, sorry, just a second. So like for this example that I, I, I wrote here, like there's zero, zero, plus, plus, all the way to minus, minus, then, you know, this one would be measuring the Z basis. I2 would be measuring the X basis. And the last one would be um, measuring the X basis. So it, it computes the measurement commands. Um, and then what the measurement device is supposed to receive from the quantum computer, like this untrusted quantum computer. So here's the QC, it's um, untrusted. It's supposed to send down supposedly the ground state of this local Hamiltonian. Um, to this trusted measurement device. And the verifier, you know, tells it to measure the sequence of measurements M and outcomes, a sequence of outcomes A1 up to AR, which is like measuring this psi, each qubit of psi and, you know, the, the uh, according to the right basis, right? Um, and then based on the outcomes, 
the verifier is, is going to be able to tell whether, like get an estimate of the energy. according to this term. Okay. And basically if, if this is equal to zero, then accept. Otherwise, uh, reject. So Right, it, like if it, you know, if according to this term, it has low energy, then you're gonna say, well, I think it's very likely that this is a yes instance. On the other hand, if it has energy that's, you know, non-zero, then I think it's, it's going to be a no instance. And, and this is going to be a, a like a, actually a, a very good protocol because if it really was a yes instance, then what this untrusted quantum computer could do is prepare this zero energy ground state. Um, and then the, the verifier will, <clears throat> you know, all the, tip, all the um, checks will pass. But in the no case, what this energy tells us is that if you sample a term at random and there's n terms, the energy is going to be on average at least two thirds. So the measurement results are going to reflect that. How do you exactly approximate the the um, the energy using the me the measurement? Okay, good. Um, so, if let's you know take a look at this example, this HI. Um, basically, think of this as telling which measurement results are forbidden. So, you know, so let's say we, we picked this HI and we look at the qubit, the measurement outcomes for qubits I1, I2, up to IK. And if any of them match this, then we know that the energy is going to be non-zero. So in that case, we would re reject. But if we get measurement outcomes that um, do, do not match any of this, like let's say for a qubit I1, we get measurement outcome one, but then we're happy. We get minus, then we're happy. If we get plus, then we're happy. And then we accept. It seems like one could definitely create Hamiltonians though, where the variance in the energy of any one term acting on the ground state is wild but the ground state energy is still zero. Well, if the ground state energy is zero, well here we're, one, one thing is that all of these terms are positive semi-definite. So if this, if this ground state energy is zero, then we actually know 100% of the time, the correct ground state will will always have energy zero with respect to all of the terms. Ah, okay. That, that, that'll do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so we are using that fact. Uh, don't you need to match all the terms for it to be non-zero? Um, uh, if, if we scroll up a bit, uh -huh. right here, if, if any of one of these terms, like if you get a so, uh, state with zero as in the, no, no, if you get a state with one in the I one qubit, then wouldn't that just change everything to zero? Like- Oh, oh yes, yes, sorry, you're right. Um, I, I think I said that wrong. Yeah, as long as uh, you, uh, oh, I see. Okay, let me put it this way. In order to get a non-zero energy, you have to match all of these, That's, that should be the right thing, right? Right. Okay, yeah. As long as you do not match any one of them, it's, it's like, um, 
what is it called? The disjunction, you know, you have or. If, if you do not match any one of them, then you're going to get zero energy. Okay, yeah, good, good catch. But isn't that like sort of counterintuitive because like it, this contradicts like the thinking of the yes case is an, is an exists case and the no case is a for all case because basically you're now saying that there, there, there is only uh, 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 one state who can get this term to be non-zero, but any uh, uh, other state, which is like, which fo follow uh, th this form will be a z, a z zero, zero, zero. So understand what's confusing me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. Um, let me make sure I have this right. I might have simplified this a little too much. Uh, Like when you explained it the the first time, I simply thought that okay, no, we are simply uh, measuring um, di di different qubits e each time on like n co co copies of this state, and then what you said previously works, I think. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, maybe I might have, um, I might have switched my yes, like, yeah. <clears throat> I might have switched um, these two cases. Um, I, I mean, you can also uh, like choose the HIs so that only one state will give you a, a yes state, right? Because if one HI is not actually, no, oh, wait, no, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, I'll have to check this, but uh, I think the um, it if there's an issue, it would be resolved by switching the yes and no cases. Like in the yes case, there's okay. there's a state with very high energy, and in the no case, um, uh, like all the energies are like all states have pretty low energy. Um, but I will have to check that. Let's see. Back, but actually, I'm not sure, like, you know, for example, with um, just to go back to the class, like, the, what's the classical analogy, like three set, like each of your clauses are forbidding exactly one assignment to the, uh, like, it, it's saying there's one, uh, like, setting of the three variables in each clause that are forbidden. So that would be kind of the analog here, we're saying that um, there's one setting to those qubits that are forbidden. So I think maybe this could be correct, <clears throat> but uh, I'll have to double check. Um, okay, now it, it actually makes more sense because uh, A and B do not know which HI I chose. And so I gave them basically a random C and F if I'm th thinking about it in class. La classical terms and their assignment needs to set, 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 satisfy it. Oh yeah, so that's a good point. So this, this untrusted quantum computer has no idea what term you're checking. You're just telling, like the verifier at the beginning says, hey, um, quantum computer generate me the supposed ground state. Um, the quantum computer generates it, sends it over, and then, and then the verifier will choose a random term to, to check. So, so the state cannot depend on the term you're checking. If it did, then, then actually that would be really bad. <clears throat> okay. Um, you know, great questions though. Uh, any, like, any other questions about this measurement-based verification?
Okay, so um, so this is pretty cool, but this is like not what we wanted. Like um, the verifier still has, um, you know, in order to do this, the verifier needs this trusted measurement device. Okay, it's a simple thing, but it's still some extra assumption. Um, and it would be nice to get rid of this, the need for this trusted measurement device. And so this is where we go back to this two player setting. Um, and the idea is to delegate the measurement to untrusted provers. Okay, so we're going to go back to this two prover model. So we have two untrusted uh, quantum computers and we have the, the classical verifier. And now we can only have classical communication between um, the quantum computers. And the, the key idea is we're going to play these uh, rigidity games like the magic square game between these two quantum computers to basically force to convert one of these quantum computers to become the trusted measurement device. Wait, so you are allowing the quantum computers to, to communicate? Is, is that what you said? No, no, no. Uh, they, they communicate with okay. the, the verifier. I see. Right, this should make like intuitive sense. Like our rigidity statements are so powerful. Like just by observing how often they win a game, we know exactly what measurements and what states they're using. And we're gonna leverage that to, to kind of simulate this verification protocol that uh, I just described. Um, so, um, right, the first step is this classical verifier can play the this repeated magic square game, and you know, let's say that the 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 two provers, the two quantum computers, win with very very high probability. Uh, let's say you knew that, then this guarantees us they must be sharing many EPR pairs, and uh, in particular, this quantum computer is going to be making these poly measurements on each of those EPR pairs separately. So um, let's see. Okay. So I'm gonna just say the number of games that we're playing is R just to connect it to this verification protocol we just saw. Let's assume that they win with probability very, very close to one. Right? Then by the rigidity thing, this implies that um, Alice and Bob share two R EPR pairs, right? Um, two EPR pairs for each of the separate games. So let's organize the EPR pairs in the following way. So I'm gonna draw, so you know, here's, here's Alice, here's Bob, so here's a pair for uh, instance one. Here's a pair for instance two, so on. <clears throat> and um, and the, you know, just to make things simple, uh, I'm going to always ignore what Bob's doing on the first EPR pair. Like we, we don't really care. So we're just gonna ignore this. So, um, so how can we turn Bob into this trusted, like to, how can we make Bob simulate this trusted measurement device? So, um, So 
So let's say we had a, a string of measurement commands that is of length r. And we wanted to say, for the first qubit measure i, for the second qubit measure in the x basis, for the third qubit measure in the z uh, basis, and so on. right? Um, and so diagrammatically, what we want him to do is measure uh, this in i, this in uh, x, and you know the last one in you know say to say z. Oops. Well, we can simulate that by by embedding those this these measurement commands inside the magic square game. So. Right, so in the magic square game, Bob receives a sequence of questions, y1 up to yr. What are these y's? They're supposed to be different cells of the magic square game, right? So the yj's and let's um, sort of recall like what the the canonical textbook strategy is supposed to look like. And I'm going to copy it really quick, uh, go up, up, up. All right, it was this, this thing here, so I'm just gonna uh, copy it. Okay, cool. So, um, if I wanted to embed it, then I'm going to focus on these two special questions, cells one and five. Like those correspond to measuring the second qubit in Z or the second qubit in X. So let's say like, just as an example, let's say M was, um, yeah, like, like I, X, Z, so on. Then we can embed this into a magic square question by saying, I, well, I'll just send them a dummy symbol because I'm just telling Bob, like, I don't really care. Um, and then for X, I will send him cell number five. And Z, I will send him cell number one and so forth. So when Bob sees this, he thinks he's playing the magic square game. And since he's supposed to be winning with high probability, he has to be doing the honest thing. So for the second instance, he has to measure his two qubits using Ix. And for the third instance, he has to be measuring Iz, right? So, so on, on these, these EPR pairs, he, he's going to be doing those measurements. And, and we know he's, he's doing them. Why do you have that dummy? Oh, I'm sorry. I know you go. You go. You go. Okay. Uh, why do you have that d d dummy thing there? Oh, uh, actually, uh, basically, I'm going to put a um, a random question. So I'm going to put a wild card. Like it doesn't matter because like we don't care what he's he's doing. He's going to do in in that coordinate. Like you just pick a pick a random cell. Like just choose one at random. He'll do whatever measurement like he does there. But we'll is just a, ignore the answer. Is there a reason why we don't care about the specific coordinate? Like, oh, because your measurement, um, your measurement command that you 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 want is i x z. So i means like uh, i just means I don't care what, uh, what oh. the measurement result is. Oh. Okay. Yeah, that was basically my question too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so you know the the point is or I'll say Bob thinks we're playing magic square. I don't think it would matter, but um could Bob kind of figure out that he's not playing magic square because of the distribution of 
uh, you know, if we're repeatedly using the top left square and the middle square, um, Bob will kind of realize that's what we're doing. Yeah. Okay, that's a uh, super good question. You're right, actually, uh, in the way I described it, just this naive mapping, um, you know, if you start seeing a bunch of fives and ones, you're like, hmm, I wonder what the verifier is asking me to do. Um, so uh, that definitely would be like a, a giveaway. Um, so the, um, the way to solve that is actually, you actually embed the M into like a larger Y. So, um, So imagine that why, like you're playing not just R games, but like, you know, R squared different games. So your Y vector is going to be super long. But then you just randomly drop in M at different locations. And then that will be enough to kind of mask uh, whether you're playing magic square or asking them to do a specific measurement. Bob is all part of powerful, isn't he? Like if our question di distribution is even, is, even, is even in the slightest uh, far away from the U, 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 uniform one, he'll be able to tell, like he'll be able to identify this. And what you're describing here is not exactly the uniform di di distribution. Good, uh, good point. So uh, it definitely won't be 100% um, the uniform distribution, but the statistical, like the, the, the statistical variation will be actually very small. And um, just based on that, Bob will not have, Bob will not be able to be 100% sure whether he's, you know, playing magic square or, or something else. And so um, it, it cannot affect his mm -hmm. strategy too much. Okay. Yeah, uh, okay. yeah, that's a really uh, good observation. Um, okay, so we're out of time. I think we'll pick this up next time, but just to look ahead, um, you, you, know, you know, now you can see like we've used this rigidity to force Bob to be a, a trusted measuring device, um, but we're missing a big part of the, the, the verification, which is like, well, how he's measuring, um, it looks like he's measuring EPR pairs, but we actually want him to measure like a supposed ground state of this Hamiltonian. Um, how does how does that happen? Um, and this is where Alice comes into play. We're going to actually ask Alice to teleport, to use this thing called quantum teleportation, uh, to teleport the supposed ground state to Bob. And then Bob will will be measuring will be actually measuring the this ground state psi instead of the maximally entangled state. Um, and and then you know we we can. Uh, basically simulate this measurement-based protocol that, that we saw. Um, so we'll pick this up next time. Um, but you know, hopefully you, you're, you're getting a sense of like how useful uh, this rigidity statement is. It's like a, a very powerful statement. All right, so um, thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, if people want to stick around and like uh, ask questions about the problem set, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Good night, everyone. Thanks. See you, Ariel. See you, guys. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you.